Hi, I'm Luna, and it's been over a month since we last saw the Bell's Hells, so let's catch up on everything that's happened so far. Episode 1, The Draw of Destiny. The story begins in Drusar, a city built on towering spires of rock on the continent of Marquette. We meet our heroes, first Imogen played by Laura and Lordna played by Marisha. They're here in Drusar to get entrance into the Starpoint Conservatory to do research on a mystery. Ashton, played by Talazin, and Fresh Cut Grass, played by Sam, have been living in Drusar for quite a while. They've only known each other for a few weeks, but they already have a blossoming friendship. Fern, played by Ashley, Aram, played by Liam, and Dorian, played by Robbie, have just arrived in Drusar via Skyship. They're here looking for somebody because Aram has been sent on a quest by Keyleth, the voice of the Tempest, for the Air Ashari. He's looking for someone called Ashard Bre aka the anger. Our heroes meet by happenstance and the will of the dungeon master when furniture starts animating and attacking passers-by outside of the markets. The group are joined by Sir Bertrand Bell and they quickly dispatch with the magical furniture. Sir Bertrand Bell is a familiar name because he appeared briefly in campaign one. Bertrand buys everybody drinks at the Spire by Fire explaining that he works for a philanthropist called Lord Estros who is looking for a group of people to do some work. It's in this conversation that we learn that Lordna is from Whitestone, a very important location in Campaign 1 and birthplace of Percy DiRolo of Vox Machina. The group arrive at Lord Estras's manor and he challenges them to prove themselves and attacks! Episode 2, Trial by Firelight. The group battles Lord Estros, who ends the fight saying that they have shown themselves to be very skillful, and he is interested in hiring them to help him in his quest to root out corruption and evil from the Chandai Quorum, which is the governing body here in Drusar. Their first job is to investigate some thefts that have been happening at Prudage Textiles. Upon arrival, half of the party go inside to speak with some of the staff, while the other half sneak around the back and onto the roof. Inside the building, Aram and FCG peek inside some crates and they find a mysterious residue which FCG recognises to be broomstone, which is the magical stone used to help skyships fly through the sky. After some frankly very awkward and suspicious conversations with the staff, the party reconvene and decide to wait until the warehouse closes so they can break in. They split into two teams, Team Full Frontal and Team Backdoor. We also learn in this episode that FCG was made by somebody called Dancer and Lordna has a pet rat, a pet stuffed rat, weird puppet thing, that she calls Pate de Rolo, named after the rulers of Whitestone. And she has no idea that the de Rolos are actually back in power at Whitestone. Episode 3 the trail and the toll. They break into the warehouse and find evidence that the thefts have been an inside job. Seemingly there are ledges that have been altered by Danas, one of the staff members. She was last seen headed to the Weary Way Tavern, so that's where they go next. They locate her in an upstairs room and they hear her talking to an older man. She's expressing some concern about the fact that the party have come around asking questions and the timings of shipments and things might need to be changed. The older man says, you're not needed anymore, and begins to choke her. So Oram and Ashton bust down the door and inside is a pale-faced dwarf who they begin to fight. He summons mutant shade creepers, which are these weird little creatures that live around Drusar, but these have had something done to them, so they look very different to the normal ones. The dwarf casts darkness, and by the time it dissipates and they've dealt with the shade creepers, the dwarf is nowhere to be seen. They find Darnus's body, as well as a mysterious hole in the wall. The party leave and agree to continue investigating. In this episode, Ashton reveals that they have a lot of debt they're trying to work off, and FCG reveals that his party was killed by a strange one-eyed creature. After everyone goes to bed, Bertrand takes a walk outside where he is set upon, attacked and murdered by the dwarf. A move that was planned by Matt and Travis because Bertrand was always meant to be a temporary character. Imogen dreams of a red storm and Bertrand walking into it. To Sir Bertrand Bell! Episode 4 on the trail of a killer. The next day, the group discover Bertrand's body and they take it to Lord Estros, who says that he will send it to Whitestone since Bertrand was associated with Vox Machina. Imogen shares with the group about her Red Storm dream, dreams that she has had many times before, but this was the first time a person had appeared in them. The party return to the dwarf's room to investigate the hole in the wall and Aram descends via a rope. He drops down a magical coin that FCG gave him, which lets you determine how far the distance is that the coin dropped, but because it dropped so far down, 1200 feet, which is about 365 meters for my metric friends, the coin is lost and it's gone forever. FCG is very sad about this, but tries to brush it off. By bribing an innkeep, they learn that the 
dwarf's name is Duggar, a carpenter who started acting a little strangely about six months ago. He had been working for or with a group called the Corsairs, a Robin Hood type thieves guild. The party informs Lord Estros of their findings, who is intrigued by the Corsairs and would like to learn more. And Oram asks Estros if he knows Oshad Brescio, and Estros agrees that he will attempt to set up a meeting. Brescio is currently recovering from wounds sustained whilst working as a bodyguard for the Loomis twins who were attacked. Following a lead from Ashton's friend Milo, the group head to Elder's Post, a kind of underground market where they have been directed to a building where they will find the Corsairs. Upon entering the building though, they are surrounded and it turns out the Corsairs are not super happy to see them. They approach with their scimitars drawn. Episode 5 the threat between the walls. The party attempt to placate the Corsairs and let them know that they're looking for Duggar. The leader, Yash Mangol, says that they need to provide some collateral so they know that they're not going to spill the beans on the Corsairs and they need to give up the names of somebody they care about. Imogen gives the name of her father, Relvin, and Ashton gives the name of Fresh Cut Grass. They learn that Duggar disappeared about six months ago for a few weeks and then when he came back, he was acting very strange and also looking very ill, kind of wasting away. He eventually left the Corsairs, but they they still kept an eye on him and they noted that he was traveling a lot from his home to the Weary Way Tavern. The group head to Duggar's home which smells strongly of mold and decay. There is a sticky residue on everything and another mysterious hole. Coming out of that hole is Duggar himself but in a weird ooze-like form. He solidifies, summons a bunch of shade creepers, even births one from his back and a fight breaks out. The party does manage to dispatch Duggar and the Shade Creepers and then they return to Lord Estros's manor. Episode 6, Growing Bonds and Teasing Threads. Introducing the new game, what the fuck is up with that? Giving us a few new character revelations. Dorian is the second son of a noble family, but he left to escape responsibility and to make his own way in life. Fern is from the Feywild, where she lived with her grandmother, Morrigan. Imogen left home about two years ago, and she has a strained relationship with her father, who didn't deal very well with the emergence of her new powers. FCG cannot really think or talk about his past, because when he tries to, he glitches out. And we get the biggest reveal of this episode, which is that Lord died around 30 years ago when she was 20. She was killed by the Briarwoods, but then she woke up. Oh yeah, and sometimes she hears Delia Briarwood talking in her mind. Oram reveals that he is looking for a Shard Breshu in relation to an attack that happened in Zephyr about seven years ago. An attack in which the assailants came out of nowhere and then seemingly melted away when the fight was done. Oshad Breshio was wounded in a similar attack, which is why Oram is looking for him. He's hoping he can provide a few more answers about who these attackers were. Estros sends the group on another job to the Dreamscape Theatre where there have been some reported disappearances in the last few weeks. They buy tickets to the show and sit down in a box seat, but Dorian is pulled away by someone who turns out to be none other than his brother, Cyrus. Dorian is surprised to see him because as he is the first son, he should be at home taking care of responsibilities. They agree that they're going to meet and talk later. Episode seven, Behind the Curtain. The party watch the show, which ends abruptly when one of the acrobats is injured. Offering to help with healing, the party are allowed backstage where they meet Stuvan, the proprietor of this theater. He reveals that six people have gone missing in the last three weeks. The group investigates and discovers an alley behind the theater where there is a spitting mimic disguised as a wall. They manage to kill it and find evidence that all of the people who disappeared were eaten by it. They also discover these strange orbs embedded in the mimic and Imogen takes one. After speaking with Stuvan again, they learned that there was some general repair work happening in the alley, which was conducted by the Treshy House Masons Guild. As they are leaving, they meet a mysterious cloaked figure who turns out to be the gnome carpenter Chetney Pocopi. This is Travis's new character. He asks for their help finding a friend. Episode 8 a woodworker's quandary. At the Spire by Fire, Chenny explains that he was kicked out of his old job in Utherdon and he was sent here to find someone called Gurge who would be able to help him find a job. Gurge is known as a wild man who likes to explore the jungles. Dorian's brother Cyrus turns up again and explains that he is in a bit of trouble. He was on a caravan escort job where a bunch of the other people escorting the caravan uh, attacked and robbed it, stealing a very valuable construct. Cyrus was left as the fall guy and there is now a 20,000 gold bounty on his head. Cyrus is determined to clear his name without the help of his parents. Dorian's real name is revealed as Bronte Second Son Wivenwind of the Silken Squall, a floating city of Air Genasi. Cyrus and Dorian are basically royalty. The next day they head to the home of Gurge and it has been tossed and there are claw marks in the furniture and evidence of blood on the floor. The landlord wonders if it might be connected to a direwolf attack that happened at a nearby factory. So that's where they head to find out. The Wardens are not particularly keen to talk about what happened 
and so Fern turns into a rat and she sneaks inside. She hears the warden talking about how Gurge was arrested, but before Fern can escape, she is stepped on by one of them and she reverts back into her normal fawn self. Episode 9 Thicker grows the meal and plot. Fern casts Charm Person on the Head Warden who reveals that they were paid by Artana Vo to help capture Gurge alive and that Gurge turned into a wild beast when attacked. Fern manages to skedaddle away and the group bring Lord Estros up to speed. He explains that Mahan Trashi are a powerful family with ties to the Quorum and if they're going to investigate them, they're probably going to need to be careful about it. He suggests that they attend an upcoming ball where they might be able to learn some more information. He also directs them to the Soot and Swill tavern which is where Artana Vo's sister works, although she denies that they're related. Fern orders a meal from Pretty the Ogre Cook and organises a date with him and Lorna and Imogen. While that is happening, Chetney, Dorian and Orem sneak into the kitchen and they find a secret door. Upon opening it, they are faced by Artana Vo pointing a crossbow straight at them. They eventually manage to talk her down by paying her all of their gold. She reveals that she was hired to find Gurge by Vali Detrana, who is the business commissioner who works out of the Moon Tower. So they get a letter from Lord Estros requesting an audience with Detrana and head to the Moon Towers. Detrana, however, is busy, so Chetney turns invisible and manages to sneak inside his office. In the office, Chetney finds a map of the Odor and Wilds, a lot of money, as well as a bunch of notes, and one in particular that says, Requested by the Nightmare King. Bring alive. He finds a secret door and stairs behind it leading down. And so he sneaks down the stairs and he hears two people talking. One of these people is incredibly creepy and the other one is kind of weirded out by the creepy person. And they're talking about their plans and how they might need to hurry them along. One of the voices who is Vali Detrana comes up the stairs and notices that the things are amiss in his office. So he starts searching around looking for the invisible person. Chetney, who is locked in the office to escape, bursts out through a window into the courtyard below. Episode 10. Ghosts, Dates, and Darker Fates. Detrana chases Chetney and some tomfoolery commences with the party managing to convince the guards that the tower is haunted. Fern recognises the name the Nightmare King. She heard about this creature as a child growing up in the Feywild and heard that he was a creature who liked to twist nature for fun. Fern, Imogen, and Lorna go off for their date with Pretty and FCG decides to come along too to see what this whole dating business is all about. Unfortunately though, love is not in the air and Pretty the Ogre asks if they can just be friends. Ashton heads to the home of Gianna Hexham, who we learn is a very wealthy collector who Ashton owes a debt to. Gianna offers them a job as she has a bet going with Evan Hytroger, the proprietor of the Twilight Mirror Museum. She needs a group to break into the museum and do so before a rival party can, a rival party put together by Mistress Sabanis. If successful, Ashton's debt will be cleared. We also learn that the construct stolen in the caravan robbery that went wrong that Cyrus was involved in did indeed belong to Gianna Hexham and she is the one who has put out the 20,000 gold bounty. Ashton shares this job offer with the group and also explains a little bit more about his backstory. He used to run with a group called the Nobodies and they broke into Hexham Manor where Ashton was injured and that is how he sustained his head injury and he is now working off this debt to Hexham after she caught him. The group return to the Mirror Towers and once again break into Detrana's office and sneak down the stairs. There they meet Ira, the Nightmare King himself. He is a weird figure with a long elongated limbs and a kind of bug-like face. He's working on a blue stone that is attached to some sort of arcane contraption. Chetney's friend Gurge is also locked in a cage there. Episode 11 chasing nightmares. The party converse with the Nightmare King who reveals that someone called Armand Treshi is the one footing the bills. He then decides he's done with this conversation and he animates furniture in the room and battle commences. This is when we get the big reveal that Chetney is not a rogue, he is in fact a blood hunter werewolf. Oh, oh! It is a tough fight and it seems like Ira is about to finish them when he looks at Fern and he reconsiders. He recognises her as being from the Feywild and he recognises her as a Callaway. He dimension doors away and the arcane machine in the room begins to power up. They quickly free Gurge and manage to escape just as the tower explodes behind them. Gurge explains that he was bitten by a werewolf and he came to Marquette looking for the Gorgonite, which is a group of werewolves who kind of control their curse. He fell out with them though and he has been running 
Solo ever since. He was captured by the Nightmare King and he was forced to bite volunteers. The reason Chetney was looking for Gurge is because he wants to find the Gorgonite as well. Gurge refuses to help but does give him the name Ajit Dayal who is somebody who can help point him in the right direction. They once again fill Eshteros in who believes that Arman Treshi is a member of the Chandai Quorum, so a very powerful figure. Next the group head to the meeting with Oshad Brescio. Oshad explains that the attack on the twins happened while they were in the Hartmoor Hamlet visiting an astronomer called Astani. Next Imogen heads to the Starpoint Conservatory where she has a letter of introduction from Estros allowing her to access the books and the tomes and the scrolls. She spends hours and hours researching the red storms in her dreams and she finds a study by Professor Khadija Sumal which focused on people who experienced the same red storm dreams which seem to be connected somehow to the celestial cycles. Within the study Imogen finds the name Lily Liana Tumult, her mother. She never met her mother and her father refused to speak of her. Episode 12, Make It Fashion. Imogen asks the attendant who last had the book with the study and it turns out it was the Loomis twins. But forget moon conspiracies, there's a ball to attend. The party goes shopping and gets themselves some very nice fancy outfits and Ashton decides to dress up as the Nightmare King because they think maybe it might draw someone out connected to him. FCG reflects on his past and with permission Imogen cast detect thoughts but she finds that there is some kind of scar uh, around the memories which means that she's not able to access them. That evening Imogen once again dreams of the red storm but this time she sees two twins walking into it presumably the Loomis twins. Back at Estros Manor they come up with a plan for the ball. Lord Estros has had a replica of one of Armand Treshi's rings made and if they can just swap those rings out at the ball we will be able to track Treshi wherever he goes. The party get all dressed up and they head off to the ball. I want to say a quick thank you to my patrons and YouTube members and a special welcome to new patrons John Leo Yu and Falcon Neil. If you'd like to support the channel you can do so on Patreon or right here on YouTube by clicking the join button underneath this video. Thank you! Episode 13, A Dance of Deception. The arrival of Lord Estros causes a bit of a buzz because he doesn't normally go out into public. The ball is being presided over by Gavas Aranda, who is the voice of the quorum. There are other names of note at the party. There is General Ratanish, who is the leader of the Paragon's Call, a mercenary group out of Hellcatch Valley who recently had a bit of a rebrand. Amand Treshi is there, of course, with a date, Lady Emoth. They meet Headmaster Grizz Alacritos, who is a researcher of ancient ruins and history. There is Lord Preston, who is the self-styled Lord of the Quad Roads. This is a familiar name again from Campaign 1. And most surprisingly, Dorian's brother Cyrus is there, seemingly connected somehow to Lady Emoth. The Dance of the Crossroads begins, which is a kind of like networking dance, and what follows is one of the most ludicrous heist scenes I've ever seen in my life. Though there are many shenanigans, the party do finally manage to swap the rings. General Ratanish approaches Ashton because they are dressed like the Nightmare King. And after a bit of to and fro, Ratanish challenges Ashton to a fight, so they head outside to uh, try and out barbarian each other. Taking advantage of the distraction of the fight, Chetney sneaks into some of the adjoining rooms and finds Lady Emoth searching through Grizz Alacritos' room, accompanied by Shade Creepers, and she is in a similar icky, gooey state to Duggar. Episode 14 in too deep. People crowd around as Ashton and Ratanish fight and Ashton is knocked out. Ratanish uses this as a chance to promote the Paragon's call and somewhat offers Ashton a job. Oram notes Armand and Gavis speaking with someone called Mistress Sashadri apparently of a lower Mahan house involved in agriculture. Chetney notices a half-orc and a gnome in green coats. These are the green seekers, well-known detectives. The party get the guards to check Lady Emoth's rooms, but they are very quickly killed or knocked out, so the party goes in there to fight her themselves. She flees through a hole in the wall saying, she will help me. And it's at this point that the party is finally given their name when Imogen introduces the group as the Bell's Hells. The Green Seekers have apprehended Cyrus, but Dorian casts Charm Person and convinces them to let him go, and they manage to slip away. The group return to Lord Estros's manor, where Cyrus explains that he was working for Lady Emoth in an attempt to pay off some of his bounty. Dorian and Cyrus are both in hot water with multiple parties looking for them, so they agree it's time to split. Lord Estros offers to put them on one of his skyships to Amman, and they say their farewells. To Robbie Damon! Episode 15, 
the tunnels below. Given how much attention is on the Bells Hills right now, they agree to take Gianna's job offer so that they can get out of town for a bit. They start heading to her house to organize the trip when they are intercepted by the Green Seekers, Ollie and Gus, who believe them to be connected to a lot of the weird happenings around Drusar. They all work out that they're sort of on the same side and they're looking for the same clues and they team up and head to the Underrush Mines in an attempt to find Lady Emoth and to get some proof that there is a bigger conspiracy at work here. The foreman of the mine is called Ogdus and he is Gus's ex, so FCG takes them through some impromptu couples therapy. Ogdus tells him that the mine has been shut down for a few months and they later find out that this was on the order of the Treshies. They descend into the mine and battle more shade creepers, but these are more mutated and larger and stronger than before. Going deeper into the mine, they discover all these cocoons and sticky things everywhere and they see Lady Emoth, who is even more transformed with weird gross holes in her back and she is beholding a giant slug-like creature on the wall, her mother, but slug mummy, as we like to call her here. Episode 16, The Shade Mother. The fight begins! With the help of a clutch daylight spell from Fern, the party managed to trap Lady Emoth in a kind of arcane ball of energy, which is created by a magical item that the Green Seekers have. Before escaping, Imogen takes a strange purple crystal from an arcane contraption in the room, kind of similar to one that the Nightmare King was working on. They all race out of the mine, rolling the ball with Lady Emoth inside, but the Shade Mother is still alive. Apparently the Wardens are going to deal with it later. The Green Seekers take Lady Emoth to turn her in to their employer, who we learn out is Mistress Sashadri, the figure at the ball who works in agriculture. FCG is acting very strange after the fight, seemingly more so than usual, so everyone agrees that they need to take a bit of a rest. Imogen examines the weird purple crystal and finds it to be kind of familiar, even though it is strange and unnatural, and Lordna also recognises something about the stone as well. Imogen falls asleep, holding the stone in her hands. Episode 17, Heart to Heartmore. As she sleeps, Imogen dreams of the red storm again, but this time in the dream, she is holding on to the purple crystal. This time she considers stepping into the storm rather than running, but she hears the voice of her mother telling her to run. And at the last moment, she does turn and manages to make it just back in time. FCG casts identify on the crystal, learning that it is a null rock, a uh, kind of stone from the Feywild that twists and corrupts nature around it. While discussing the Feywild, Fern reveals that she left the Feywild to look for her parents. They left when she was quite young and they've sent her letters from various places they visited, including a place called Aor, which Campaign 2 watchers will recognize as the fallen city that the Mighty Nine investigated. The Bell's Hells leave Drusar and come across a rabbit holding a Feywild shard in its mouth, which Imogen attunes to, yet another link to the Feywild. Throughout the course of their travel, Lordner reveals more about her backstory and confirms a very popular fan theory. She was brought to the Briarwoods, uh, had a feast and was then killed, and she awoke hanging from the sun tree. She was in fact the double for Vex when Vox Machina entered Whitestone and saw those bodies hanging from the tree dressed as themselves. Ooh. Aram, of course, knows of this story and is very horrified to hear that Laudner was involved in it in this way. He also explains that his tattoos of a big moon and a little moon are representative of his husband, Will, who was killed in the attack on the Arashari seven years ago. As they're traveling they come across a fairy creature that lures them to a carnivorous plant. Roll initiative! Episode 18, A Hungry Jungle. The Bell's Hells battle the hungry plant, during which Imogen activates her Feywild Shard for the first time and it turns her skin completely blue. A few party members being swallowed later, FCG gets the how do you want to do this using his buzzsaw. Imogen and Aurum find a pre-calamity pillar in the jungle, which might be from an old orcish and elven city that used to be here but was destroyed in the calamity. On the road, the party meet another group made up of a Katari, a human, a goblin, and a furbolg, being led by a dragonborn, and they are also on their way to Hartmore Hamlet. The Bell's Hells arrive and acquire rooms at the Sudden Grange Inn before checking in with Evan Hytroger at the museum. He is very flamboyant and very extra and I love him. They then visit Astani who is an older Unia and he welcomes them into his home. Episode 19, Omens Above. Astani explains a little more about the attack on the Loomis twins and how the assailants seemed to come from nowhere and then to melt away after they were killed. All of the twins' belongings had gone missing, which means that the assailants probably took them as they escaped. Astani became friends with the Loomis twins after they reached out to him because of his astronomical research. They were studying Ruidus, the smaller moon of Exandria, which behaves very oddly. It sometimes appears in the sky, sometimes it disappears in the sky, and it has a very slow orbit around the planet. People who are born under Ruidus 
are said to be Ruidus born and cursed. The twins were planning on visiting the Omen Archive in Eos, which is where Professor Khadija Sumal, who completed that study that Imogen's mother was in, uh, was located. The party stock up on supplies, finding that the group they met on the road earlier is indeed the rival party. Imogen and Ashton head to a store with homemade toys and they find these weird creepy puppets, which were apparently made by someone called Altgar. And we've heard that name before because that is Chetney's employer in Uthodern. Altgar is apparently a cutthroat and a nasty person. They buy one of these creepy puppets for Laudner who calls it sashimi. That evening, they return to Astani's house and they look through the telescope, seeing upon the surface of Ruidus these red storms, exactly like the storms in Imogen's dreams. She's dreaming of Ruidus! That night, Imogen falls asleep, dreaming of the storms, but this time, instead of turning and running, she steps into the storm. And inside, she sees a figure, a woman, smiling at her, a woman she doesn't recognize. And behind this woman are other figures stepping out, uh, ten in total. Imogen wakes up with even more questions. The next day, the party head back to the museum, ready for the heist. Episode 20. Breaking and entering. The heist begins! Bell's Hells need to retrieve an earring called Wind Folly, and they need to get it before the rival party, who are called The Verdict. Many Home Alone shenanigans ensue, and the party come across a number of artifacts, including what looks like a broken beacon of the Kryn dynasty, as well as supposedly the Journal of Vespen Chloris. The figure who released the betrayer gods and kicked off the calamity. Chetney falls into an ooze trap and Aram helps him out, but not before Chetney takes a swipe at him as his bloodlust feature kicks in. They make it to the room with the earring in, and as they are trying to open the case, two clay constructs begin to form. Episode 21, Fight at the Museum. Combat begins! While one part of the group is trying to fend off these constructs, the other part are trying to get the glass case open. Eventually they do, but as they turn to leave, they find that the verdict has barricaded them in using Laudner's own immovable rod. They are forced to fight the constructs, and once they've defeated them, they come up with a plan. When the verdict enters an adjoining room, Imogen uses her telekinetic abilities to trigger a trap in there over and over again, severely wounding them and even knocking some of them unconscious. The Bell's Hells help to stabilize them and a bit of a truce is called. While they're on their way out of the museum, they rifle through Hytroga's home, finding a bunch of papers as well as a magical pair of glasses. They present Wind Folly to Hytroga, thereby winning the bet for Gianna Hexum. The next day, they examine the papers and find that many of the artifacts in the museum are actually commissioned fakes, and they also discover that Hytroga has been spying on Hexum, that he has been watching her and these shipments that she's been uh, making and receiving of wooden crates. Also within these notes is the name Spiraling Shen, a leader of the crime syndicate in Taldore, the class. Before leaving town, Astani approaches Orem and tells him a little bit more information about this group called the Grim Verity. It's a kind of secret society of scholars whose research borders on almost blasphemous. Astani used to be a member when he was younger, and he's a little worried that they're somehow connected because the Loomis twins were also members. He tells Orem to seek out Ebenold Kai in Eos at the Adolin Seminary, and the party travels safely back to Drassar. Episode 22, Promise and Potential. The party return to Hexa Manor, and Ashton's debt is officially cleared. Gianna Hexum is very intrigued by FCG and requests to examine him. FCG is not really okay with this and sort of stands up for himself, as well as the other automatons in the city, explaining that they are being mistreated. While this is happening, Ashton notices a wooden crate under one of the tables, and this reminds him of the night that he was here for the robbery. The Bell's Hells go to see Lord Estros, who tells them that Armand Treshi has been pinpointed as a conspirator and is currently being hunted down. Treshi has fled the city towards Basaras, which is where the headquarters of the Paragon call is. He asks the party to track Aman down, offering the use of his skyship, and he also passes over a letter from Vexalia thanking them for returning Bertrand's body. Next, they head to Dial Hall, which is kind of a public school, to meet with Arjit Dial, the person that Chetney was instructed to seek out to find more information about the Gorgonai. Arjit explains that the Gorgonai saved him and his wife, and they have a somewhat friendship and, and working relationship. Ajit tells Chetney that he can find the Gorgonai by going out into the jungle and howling at the moon. Later, Imogen offers to help Ashton remember what happened the night of the robbery since their memory is kind of fuzzy. She casts Detect Thoughts on him, assisted by FCG, and we see him pulling out a potion from a crate, or it's a vial, but it's a potion, uh, which has a silvery liquid in, very similar to potions of Dunamancy, which we saw in Campaign 2. 
Then these red runes start to glow on the ground and an explosion knocks Ashton out of the window and he receives his head injury as he hits the ground and his friend Milo helps kind of patch him back together and he does so by pouring that potion, which is probably this potion of dunamancy directly into the head wound, which is probably where Ashton gets all of his kind of dunamantic weird chaos powers. Episode 23, To the Skies. While everyone is sleeping, Chetney heads back to the Prism Emporium so that he can harass a shopkeeper for overcharging him on a chisel. He scares the absolute heck out of her in her werewolf form, and she promises to never do it again. The next day, the group board Lord Estros's skyship, which is headed up by Captain Xandus. One evening on the skyship, Lordna and Imogen are discussing the strange purple crystal that Imogen has been sleeping with. Lordna feels a strange urge to hold it and to look at it, so she asks Imogen if she can, and Imogen is very protective of the stone, but then agrees, since Lordna is her best friend. As Lordna holds the crystal, she hears the voice of Delilah Briarwood in her mind, saying, this is too dangerous for you, let me deal with it, and she grips the stone tighter and tighter as she feels this heat surge over her body, and then the crystal cracks broken, all of the magic gone from it. Imogen is absolutely devastated, and Lordna screams at Delilah, who just thanks her for her help. That is not good. Episode 24, The Hellcatch Valley. Whilst traveling aboard the skyship, Oren notices a large creature burrowing underground, chasing a caravan. Captain Xandus says that this is a dustra, kind of like a terrestrial squid, and it's behaving very oddly because normally they're not carnivorous. FCG talks with it via speak with animals and learns that it is looking for its young, its children, and it believes that the caravan has taken them. Using chains shot from the skyship, they manage to pick up this giant creature and sort of lift it off and put it down somewhere else, saving the caravan who, they do check, uh, did not have the Dustra children. Captain Xandus drops them at Basaras and they find rooms at the Raha Den. Whilst on watch, FCG shares with Chetney that he is being followed by a bird, a bird that won't leave him alone that he has dubbed Shithead, who is constantly following him around and pooping on his head. <laughs> Chetney agrees that he will keep an eye out for this bird and protect FCG from it. The next morning, whilst walking through the city, the Bell's Hills come across someone being attacked, an elf. They step in and fend off the attackers, and we learn that this elf is called Dusk, and she is desperately trying to get back to the Feywild. Dusk, of course, is played by Erika Ishii. The group decide to get some food at a taste of Tal'Dorei to continue the conversation further. Well, that is all the major events that have happened in Campaign 3 so far. If you'd like full in-depth breakdowns, make sure you subscribe because I release one every week after the episode. And I'll see you next time. Bye!